and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about lava bases so i actually already did a video on this um back in my ho earlier hobby cheating series but um I, it's something that i've still been working on um, because i've never truly been completely happy with how the old ones turned out so um this is sort of a newer technique that i've stumbled upon i guess over some experimentation and i wanted to share it with everybody so I want to talk about what I've done here so far to prep up for this. Um, so this is a 80 millimeter round base, but you could do this on most size bases. Um, what we've got here is some cork, obviously, that we've built up. Um, just pretty simple. You can see the layers of the cork. Um, I then covered over like a lot of it on the sides on the top with um, some Vallejo white stone. Now, I quite like this particular basing paste. I'll give you a look here of what it looks like. It's kind of smooth, and like it's real smooth. It has no texture to it. Um, when it dries, it dries in this very smooth sort of, almost like rock slate sheen. So I put that all over everything and let it dry. And then on top of what I wanted to be the rocks, which are obviously these elements here, right? Um, you'll notice I made channels where uh, I, I wanted the lava flow to be. Um, so when I built up the cork, I made sure to leave these little channels in here. Um, on top of the rocks, I then used some white pumice, which is exactly what it sounds like. This has a lot of texture to it, you can see there. And so that dries like this. You can see the very rough texture there. And then over, I wanted to kind of really simulate the flow, and you can see that glossy, soft mixture. And so that's something I've been playing with recently that I quite enjoy, which is this right here. This is Liquitex Gloss Gel, Gel Medium. Um, you can get a giant tub of this off Amazon, pretty cheap, um, which is where I got mine. Um, and it, just we'll take a look at it here. You can see what it looks like as well. You can see it has just a real soft kind of jelly nature to it. It's basically exactly what it says on the tin. Um... Sorry, I'm struggling with getting the lid back on. Okay, there we go. All right. So then I applied all of that into these channels to be the lava. Okay? So, and everything's dry now. That's the only reason I did this before I recorded anything, because all this takes hours to dry, so I didn't want to just record 10 seconds of video and then wait hours. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I just got a big gloppy brush, and I, you know, dropped all this stuff in there. I don't think you need to see me apply base and texture to a base. I think you can figure it out. So what I'm going to do now is head over to the airbrush booth and we're going to prime all of this, including over this gel medium. And then what I'm going to do is actually the rocks I want to be black. And I want the lava obviously to be nice and hot. So what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of doing our normal zenithal, we're going to highlight in here with the white. Okay. And so I'm going to come back before I put any other colors on and show you how this turns out after sort of the priming and sort of pseudo zenithal stage. And then I'll talk about how we're going to apply our colors. Okay, so we'll be back in just a moment. All right, and we're back. So you can see here everything's all primed up and colored. And so what I did is we covered the whole thing in our traditional gray black primer, but then here where I want the lava to be, I took the gray and I just kind of was around here. Now, you'll notice I was a little messy with the gray and I did kind of go at an angle over the rock to kind of pick out some of this texture, okay? And we're going to come back to that in a little while later. But, and then I took my white and I really, really reinforced this. I want to get rid of most of the black. One of the few times that black undershading really doesn't work is with yellows, and, and oranges and reds because they're undertoned by brown. So at this point, we're gonna head over to the airbrush booth and I'm gonna actually take you in there. And we're gonna, you're gonna see how I go about painting the actual lava. You can see now how that gloss medium has dried and it has this really nice like flow to it. It looks liquid, right? In the way that it dries, like especially like look at this nice texture in here. You can really see it now that it's actually painted. 
So, and you can see there's overspray. I wasn't hyper careful with the airbrush and that's purposeful because I'm not painting anything on these rocks yet. I'm gonna leave them black. We're gonna go straight into the lava. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I want there to be some overspray because we're gonna use that to get free OSL on these rocks, okay? All right, so next up, we're gonna pick up in the airbrush booth and we're gonna talk about colors. So back in just a second. All right, so we're here in the airbrush booth and you can see these are the colors that we're gonna use here. So I've got, and, and again, if you don't happen to have the, you know, Vallejo game or model air, it doesn't really matter. You just need roughly equivalent colors. So let's start out with some light rust, which is a very brown red. Now, this is going to be our undershade. Like I said, black doesn't work well with yellow and orange. So we're going to change that by doing some quick undershading. Next up, we've got some gory red, which is just a nice, rich, sort of darker red, because we want to have some darker reds. And then we've got orange and yellow, quite fairly obvious. This is orange fire and sun yellow. Notice that this is a fairly um, muted yellow. This isn't like a very bright white yellow, and that's important. I don't, I don't really want a super bright white yellow because I'm going to use white to control that directly. This is just game air dead white. Okay, so let's get those out of there. We've got the airbrush ready to go, um, and we've got our thinner lined up. And of course, what we're going to do here is I'm going to start out with some of the light rust. Okay. And this is going to be a very quick little touch um, of the light rust because we're not going to do a whole lot with this. We're just using this to get rid of some of the black and the gray that's going to not look great under our... Uh, so you can see I just have the tiniest amount of paint down in there. Okay, so what I'm going to do with my light rust is here where where I want there to be shadows in the lava, where I want it to be the darker color. I'm just laying some of this up in here. Like this is all gonna be stuff that's darker red near the rocks. So to get rid of any gray that's still left over from my zenithal, because the white is helpful to me, the gray is not. I'm just using this to undershade it, okay? So you can see I'm kind of forcing this down under the rocks in kind of areas that are more recessed, things like that. We're just going to, it's going to help us create some hot spots later. Okay. So, there we go. You can see very light touch of that around. Not much. And you can see this is a, like, I really love this light rust color because it's just a wonderful, warm, very ruddy brown as it is. So it's, uh, but it's very thin and doesn't have a huge effect. Okay, get rid of the rest of our paint. Now let's get into the lava itself. So very quickly, just run some cleaner through my airbrush. People often ask me, uh, I see the question come up a lot of like, how do you use an airbrush to go through a bunch of paints? Doesn't it take forever to clean it in between paint? changes and my answer is no not if you're using properly thinned paints because there that's clean done just like that what did that take three seconds so a couple drops thinner in the airbrush first now we go to our gory red and again always a very minimal amount of paint when you're doing stuff like that again there's there's how much is in there not a lot Thinner in first, finger over the tip, mix it up. You've seen that all before if you've watched me airbrush anything. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to just hit all of this. Again, it's going to overspray some, and that's okay. Now, one thing that's going to happen when you put red over your white is you're going to get a very sort of bright, crisp, almost pinkish color with a lot of this. That's okay. Don't worry. 
We knew that was going to happen. Okay. That's all going to be fixed up later on. You can see when we get this red up on the black, if it's actual black, it really doesn't change much of anything. If we had a little bit of the white or gray overspray, in that case, now it actually looks it actually looks like a little bit of OSL coming up onto there. So now we've got a nice red lava base. All right. Now we come to building up the layers. Get rid of our extra red here. And this is where the secret comes in. Once again, we just got to clean the paint out real quick. So what we're going to do here is, rather than try to build up the orange directly over top, we're going to do a little bit finer control here, and we're going to use undershading to our advantage. Okay? And the way we're going to do that is with that white. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some quick lines through here to create hot spots with the white. Okay? And you'll see exactly what I mean by that. But this is one of those things that requires a little bit of finer touch of control with your airbrush. Um, when people use their airbrushes, especially if they tend to start out, they tend to all the time depress the trigger all the way. So they tend to push this down all the way. But there is space that is less than fully pressed there. So what I like to do is, and, and that's going to control your airflow. See, so that's not down all the way, and then I can rock it back and just let in the paint, because down controls the airflow, backwards controls the paint flow. That's why it's a dual action airbrush. So we're gonna use our thumb, think of like you would hold a pencil, and I'm gonna use that to push against my finger, and then rock it back slowly. Let me do that from the side. See how I'm just barely pulling that? And that's gonna have be, that plus putting it very close is how we get nice controlled thin lines. Okay. So very minimal, I'm just going to create my hot spots. And that's my goal here. Very minimal airflow, very minimal paint flow. I want to leave most of this red and be very controlled about how I place my white. You really can use your airbrush as a very fine tool. And the key, for me at least, is having that thumb pen-like control on it, okay? Okay. And I want, looking at this base, I want this area right here in the center to be the hottest. So you can see there where we've laid our white in. Great. Done. Easy peasy. Get rid of the rest of our white. Get rid of that. Get out of here. All right. Now, now we continue on. It's important when you're using white through an airbrush like that, that you use plenty of thinner, but not too much. I mean, I know that's a silly thing to say because now I've put you in a position where you have to, I don't have an exact ratio for you, you got to be careful though, because it'll get chalky if you're, you know, if you're not careful. Um, the answer is you get, you'll just have to find the right amount. What I'll say is white is more important than any other color that you're going to put through your airbrush to keep nice and liquid, because white will want to chalk, it will want to to spray and create, <coughs> excuse me, and create little dots. If you ever see dots come out of the end of your airbrush because usually the paint gets a little too dry, you get some tip dry, something like that. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're gonna go to our orange fire. Yeah. Now, besides being a very appropriate name, orange has the wonderful property of being an extremely thin color, extremely thin. Very transparent, you can see how much orange I've got in there. Hold the tip, mix it up. Do a little test on our paper here, slightly off camera. Okay, now 
that's a real challenge when we're trying to get good coverage, but here we're using undershading, so orange is one of our best friends. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go ahead and give everything more or less a spray. You'll notice I'm not being near as careful here. But what I'm doing, where it hits the white, you'll notice it turns very yellow. Where it hits the red, it's simply tinting that red to be a more orangish red, which is, of course, exactly what we want. So, what we get now is something like that. Now we're getting that look of lava. And just because of that white undershading, like, look how easy that was. Okay, and already, like, honestly, I could probably stop here, but I want to build up my hot spots a little bit more. That's the key, where that using a very thin, transparent orange can really be a great advantage to you in this case. Okay. Cool beans. Nito burrito. All right, so now we're gonna take some of our yellow, yellow being the other famously transparent color. Now, there's a couple ways you could go here. If you wanna create some real hot spots, okay? Something that's like really, really hot lava. We could go back to our white. In fact, I'll show you that real quick, just so you can see what it would look like. If you wanna just simply reinforce the yellow, it depends on how hot you want your lava to look, okay? You could even, if you're very careful, at the end, you could even use a little white. Like, if lava's super hot, it can have a white sheen to it at the very end. Okay. So we got a little bit of white, and once again, we're going to have very, very tight control. And now we're just hitting just a very few spots. All right? Just the fewest. Because we want to create these little tiny hot spots. Okay. Now, I think you understand where this is going probably at this point. Because now we're going to take our yellow, and once again we're going to cover everything over. Yellow being a famously garbage color for coverage. Um, anybody who's ever tried to paint yellow over direct black knows that that's the case, and, uh, by the way, don't do that. Zenith will highlight your stuff, people, okay? If you're gonna paint yellow, why, why are you trying to put yellow over black? Do you hate your life? Do you not value your time? The only thing in your life you'll never get back your time? You just feel like throwing your life away? That's what I think when I see people painting yellow over black. Okay, so now we're gonna take some yellow, Again, very little. Like, I really have very... I, this is two drops of paint down in my cup. Okay? With two, and one drop of thinner. Okay. So now, what we're going to do... Is we're going to just drop in that yellow very quickly, focusing especially on... We can hit some of the red areas, too. Again, it's just going to all work harmoniously and act like tint for what we just did. Okay. And that just that easy. There we go. Now we have got some hot, hot, hot lava. You could even add a drop of white into here, and maybe if you really wanted an area to be super hot, you could just add, drop, you know, like without changing your paint cup, just drop a little bit of the white in there, and you're good to go. All right, so that's what we're going to do here. We'll go back to the desk, and I'll show you how I'm going to finish up the stone. Back in just a moment. All right, and we're back at the desk. So you can see everything here is nice and dry. And I think that lava is looking pretty good. I like how that came out. Okay, so, but we need to get these rocks under control. We've got some nice texture on here, and even these obsidian rocks still have some color to them, but it's pretty minimal. We've already got a little bit of, of our OSL going on here because of where we oversprayed, and that was purposeful. You can see how those rocks are showing a bit red. We're going we're gonna to reinforce that a little later, but we'll get to that. Um, 
But right now what we've got is three colors. We've got some Vallejo Game Color Cold Gray, our old friend Nolan Oil, and some Scale Color 75 Intense Black Ink. Okay, the thing about light is it casts shadows, perhaps unsurprisingly. I, my guess is you already knew that. So, and volcanic rock tends to be pretty black anyways. So, what I'm going to do here is I need to, I want to pick out some of this texture. So, I got a nice big dry brush. I'm going to get some of this cold gray on my brush. I like the cold gray because even though it's called that, it's actually a very brown gray, which makes it warm. I don't know why they named it such. But as usual, we're going to work it into the bristles. I'm just wiping it on a, on a uh, towel here off camera. And very simply, I'm going to pull away. Directionality can be important even in dry brushing. Okay? So the key is I'm going to pull away from the lava. Okay? And I'm just trying to get that texture nice and picked out. Very simple. I'm sure we all know how to dry brush. Now I'm going to focus some on the edges here. Okay? I want the actual edges of this. Not any that have already been oversprayed. Okay? Instead, I want to focus on these other edges that didn't catch much in the way of overspray. Alright? Where they are. Alright? Now, Here's where we get to uh, our little secret. We want to reinforce the uh, the nature of this as being hot. So there's actually a th another color I'm going to use that I didn't mention, and I purposely left it out because I wanted to talk about it right here. Okay. We need to blacken these up, but first we want to make sure we capture our light. All right. And so to do that, but it's got to be muted got to be less than everything else. What I mean by that is it can't be the same color as any of the lava. The light that it would be casting is always going to be dimmer than the actual thing itself. So for that, we're going to turn to some Vallejo model color whole red. You can use any very dark brown red. If you don't have a dark brown red, just take a red and mix it with a little brown. It's pretty much that easy. Okay, now this stuff is famously thick. Okay, I don't know why, it just is. It's a very, it's kind of an annoying color to work with. I'll warn you of that right now. Um, it likes to separate, it's very thick. So make sure you shake it a lot, make sure you mix it up. And once again, we're gonna get some of that on our dry brush and we're gonna work it out of the bristles. And this time we wanna really, really, really make sure we work it out. We don't want a lot of this. Okay. Now, in the same directionality, we're going to pull that hull red. And you'll have to, if you did it right, you've got to hit this a lot to make the paint come off. Like, you'll notice how many times I'm, I'm scraping my brush across here. You don't want to be pulling a lot of color off with one pass of the brush. Ideally, this should take a while. And by a while, I mean 20 seconds. So now what we've got, let's get that up there. There you go. You can see now what we've got is a little bit of red tint on those rocks. 
And if you don't like the amount you've got, you can take it up. The camera's washing out a little bit on my red. This looks a little more red in real life. Now we're going to build in our shadows, and to do that we're going to use the Nuln Oil and the Scale 75 Black Ink. Now the reason I'm using the Scale 75 Black Ink in this case is because it actually has a little bit of a gloss to it when it dries, which I like because Obsidian Rock has a little bit of a shine to it. Um, if you don't have the Scale 75 Black Ink, you could just rely on Nuln Oil. You could even mix in, oops, sorry, you could even mix in a little bit of um, uh, just like gloss medium or something in there, that'd be fine, whatever you like. Or you can skip it completely if you don't care. All right, so, let's go ahead and get some of our Nuln Oil. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that Nuln Oil and we're gonna drop it in here away from the edges, and I'm not being too careful about this. That is to say, I'm letting it pool a little, because I want it to. That's going to be helpful here. And if I've got an area that's pretty cloaked in shadow, like down in this little recess here, under these, I'm really getting it up in there. Really, really getting it up in there. Like down in there, right? We, we want that to be nice and dark. We need very dark darks to contrast the light. Things don't look as bright. Things look brighter when matched against things that are dark. I've said this before in many videos. I'll say it again because I see this quite this kind of thing come up all the time. If you want something to look bright, put it next to something very dark. Okay. Imagine a white circle sitting on a white piece of paper. It is not going to be very visible. Now put the same white circle on a black piece of paper. It will seem much, much, much brighter. And that's a fairly silly example, but it's instructive of what I'm talking about. And I say this a lot, and yet I still see the question come up all the time. So, okay. So we're dropping this wash in here all over the place. And then we can kind of, you know, we can kind of smooth the edges we can get most of it off our brush, and we can smooth out some of those edges. But there we go. So now we can kind of pick out some of that texture, right? You can see how that's going to go. Now, obviously, that's got to dry, and it will look much different once it's dry. Okay. All right. All right, so now we go to our Scale 75 black ink. This, sorry, I noticed a little bit too much of a pool there. You want to let this pool some, but not, not crazy town pooling. As usual, we've got to let this wash dry, but our next plan is going to be very simple. I'm going to take this black ink, and I'm going to lay it around in the darkest edges. So here and here here away from the lava everywhere where it's away from the lava flow okay so i've got to let this wash completely dry before i do that so i'll come back in just a moment i'm going to go ahead and apply the black ink and let it dry and so you'll see what happens from there but it's pretty straightforward we're just going to drop it around here in this edge you know these darkest darkest points we're making the darkest parts black 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 all right back in a moment and we'll be all done and there we go. Everything is dry, and you can see how that came out. We've got our nice, you can see the slight gloss, the sheen on the edge where we laid that glossy ink in. And the interesting thing about gloss colors is since they create a bit of their own light and reflection, they actually seem darker by comparison. It's a strange contradiction, but it's just one of those realities. So there we go. All set. Our lava base is complete. We've got some nice flowing lava we can see got picked out. Um, we've got our very dark rock. We've got some good texture. We've got some reds mixed in there. Good stuff all around. 
Um, by the way, if you don't happen to have an airbrush, I'll say as a final note, you could do everything I did here in the center with a medium with a brush. You would just follow the same exact steps. So it's not, and then to get over the edges here, you would just rely completely on dry brushing. It's not as though the airbrush is an absolutely essential tool. So we'll end on a little photo of this, but there you go. There's Lava Bases 2.0. Uh, much happier with the new version. I certainly hope you enjoyed this. Give it a like if you found it useful. Subscribe for more hobby cheating in the future. Uh, leave a comment of uh, what you thought or what hobby cheating you want to see in the future. I love suggestions. Sharing this with somebody is always the nicest thing you can do. I really do appreciate that. And uh, we will see you next time.